Welcome to What the World is Watching. Here's your host, John and Doska. Hello, everyone, and once again, welcome to the show. Today, we have a huge, huge, huge guest. You know him as the hardcore legend, the Hall of Famer, the number one New York Times bestselling author, and now comedian. He doesn't really need an intro anywhere in the civilized world, but he's going to get one because he deserves it. It's Mick Foley, and uh, I got a chance to catch up with Mick before one of his comedy shows, and we had a great time talking about lots of different things, what you hear. I'm not going to waste too much time talking. We're going to get right into it, but before we do, I do want to mention that uh, at the beginning here, Mick gets a gift, and when you hear what that is, um, it's actually a, a book that was that was written by Sylvester Stallone, a novel that became a movie. Actually, uh, one of his earlier movies that he did right after Rocky. Just want to give you a little bit of that context in case it's not really clear, kind of what we're talking about as we uh, begin the interview and everything. But I'm not going to waste any more time. We're going to get right to it. Here's my interview with Mick Foley. Joining me right now is somebody who has always been one of my all-time favorites. I know people say that, but this is true. In fact, I had a 16th birthday, and my mom did everything was all mankind. We had the plates and everything else, and the cake and, and everything. So uh, joining me right now is the hardcore legend, uh, the best-selling author, the Hall of Famer, Mrs. Foley's baby boy, the only guy that maybe has more nicknames than Apollo Creed, perhaps. <laughs> uh, Mick Foley, how are you today? I'm doing good. If I'd known you were that big a fan i would not have scheduled this interview now, now i'm a little okay. scared <laughs> tell you, but you know what you've uh, you did a great let me just say john you did a great uh, job on a documentary 10 minute documentary that we put on the, uh, the, the the website and that i tweeted out to give people a better idea what i did on the show and so uh you know you, you we were just talking about the tendency for uh you know performers you have to be up you have to be on all the time even if it's a meet and greet, you know, even when you're tired, you know, you're kind of like in some ways acting more excited, you know, more energetic, certainly than you would normally be. But you've been around me enough to see when there's the lulls and uh, sure. it's it's another I think it's another look at what a guy does. It's not like I, I sit down and badmouth people, uh, but, uh, you know, you're driving in that car and you kind of like, ah, like you let go. And and I just mentioned I'm going to be 50 now. It's like it's harder to do those 15 straight dates on the road with 15 meet and greets and wait you know and you know in some cases go without sleep uh for a few days at a time so you can do the morning media and so i've kind of like you know just told my publicist like listen i'm gonna be 50 like i can't do this anymore like i'm gonna i would rather like have a show that's like three quarters sold out than then miss a day, you know, you just got to weigh it out. I know I'm going way off on a tangent, but oh, that's uh, fine. it's again, and I know I use this rationale uh, or this <laughs> analogy to the tortoise and the hare, uh, you know, over lunch, over a completely different subject. But, uh, you know, I think part of life is figuring out how you get to the finish line. And uh, if history proves anything, it's that the hare usually doesn't make it first. So sometimes slow and steady does win the race. Absolutely. And then apply that to what I was talking about in any way you see fit. Will do. Well, Mick, thank you again. I really appreciate your time, and it's always fun getting to talk to you. And you're, you know, Where's my present? Okay, I, I got a present right, for right. you. So this is, again, a thank you for doing this. And you know, I really got to enjoy the couple of days we got to spend together doing the documentary. And I know it's something for your website, but it was really fun for me to do. So this is something as a thank you. So, um, you know, I don't know if this is something you want to comment on. And uh, I mean, see, okay, see if I'm you opening. remember, this it's is based a, off of a red bag. And it is, uh, it appears to be a book. And it is, oh, Paradise, <laughs> Paradise Alley. Oh, that's a good one. And do you, and you know the story behind you, this, right? Well, you right? told me the story. I remember the, the story we were driving uh, you know, to, the, to your next show, and you told me the story of uh, the story of my uh, my copy of Paradise Alley is that uh, uh, I had good memories for me. I, I think I was 12, 12 or thirteen on Christmas Eve when you try to uh, you try to open up that present that you can use that night. And in this case, it was a paperback novel of Paradise Alley, and I remember reading it that in, that entire night. You know, this was my you know my po. This is way past my believing era you know yeah. so so there was already some magic 
um, that wasn't there for Christmas Eve. So that to be able to read that all night was like a, a really cool night. Fast, fast forward several years after Stallone had been on the, uh, on Raw, a Raw that I wasn't, you know, I wasn't part of, I wasn't a regular part of, uh, the company then, but I reached out to WWE's, um, um, to, to their uh, talent relations people, ask if I might be able to get a hold of uh, Stallone's uh, publicity agent. I, I know better than to try to say, hey, get me Sly's address. And I wrote a really nice letter uh, to Stallone because Ro the new Rocky had just come out and uh, in preparing to watch that in the theater, my wife and I had gone back to watch the originals. And then my son, like, walked in on us you know like the most the, the second most embarrassing <laughs> scenario you can walk sure, in on sure, as yeah. a parent you know you're kind of your uh, the second one was the one he walked in and that's to catch your dad crying you know or close to it you know i yeah. was like fighting back those tears and huey was only like six at the time maybe five but like he and Mickey like immediately took to rocky on levels that i didn't get until i was much older about how it's you know, a relationship, it's not about the fight, it's about the relationship. But probably the most poignant part of that movie to me is uh, when, um, you know, Burgess Meredith puts, you know, he like, he casts his pride aside to go uh, ask Rocky if he can be his manager. And Rocky gives that great, you know, that, that great, that great speech about his prime, which I, I always wanted to turn uh, into a story on stage about, uh, you know, you'd have to set it up by the big dance in the spring and, Somebody said, you know, well, you know, Mick, uh, you know, I, you know, at least, you know, I went to the the prom. <laughs> what about my, what about my, what about my prom, Mick? <laughs> you talk about your prom. At least you had a prom. I never had a prom. Anyway, anyway, there's a way to make it work. I just no haven't. Prom stinks. <laughs> yeah, no prom stinks. I can't dance. I don't. Another leg ain't working. Um, sorry, I went off of that tangent, but that's something. One of these days, I have the courage to try to make happen on the stage. But in this case, um, I sent a really nice letter, and I sent the my copy of Paradise Alley. <laughs> and this is not meant to make Stallone sound bad in any way, although it will make his publicist sound a little bad. Maybe, yeah. Uh, a little bit. Uh, it's in the self-addressed, stamped envelope. It's everything you do to make it as easy as possible. And she goes, what's the book for? <laughs> and he called me out, and I said, well, it has a special memory. You know, I wrote in the letter about the Christmas Eve, and I was hoping maybe he could sign it and uh, put it in the envelope that I provided and send it back. And she goes, can you keep it? And I said, okay. <laughs> she said, like, I don't think he has any of these. And so, uh, yeah, and so the, Sly Stallone has my copy of Paradise Alley, and now uh, you've, uh, th you know, very you know graciously given me a hardcover. So... Man, that's a good present. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. No problem. That was something that I I, I really latched onto that story for. So I just thought it was so odd that it was it was just a very odd. Yeah, request to... especially I've heard, I've heard over the years, and his brother Frank told me that you know that Sly was a fan. You know, they used to watch some of the stuff I did, and be, you know, like fans. And and Sly was obviously a fan because Paradise Alley is a. The novel and the, the novel he wrote in the first uh, movie he directed, and it's about professional wrestling yeah. in uh, I think the thirties, nineteen thirties or early forties, and uh, a movie that I really wanted to see with my kids. It was just going through Netflix, and I was like, "Oh wait, wait, I'm going to wait and watch that one with my kids." But there's so many great wrestling. You know, you look through the credits, it's like a who's who of wrestling at that time with with Terry Funk playing, you know, the the primary yeah. wrestling or the secondary secondary to. Uh, uh, Sly's brother in the in the movie, but uh, Terry is Frankie the Thumper, and does an amazing job. Doesn't even look like himself. Does an amazing job, but that, that's that's a cool present. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Yeah, enjoy it. There's a great picture of Sly working really hard on the back of the book. Actually, it looks like he's writing. If, if you see that, so yeah. Oh um, man, you can see that. Yeah. yeah. And he and he sang so far from paradise. Right. Yeah, he sang so far. That's from right. Paradise. That's right. Yeah. We wouldn't see him sing much later until Rhinestone, uh, which was, uh, you know, whatever. But I want to talk to you about the, let's talk about the Rocky movies and stuff. Yeah, like, yeah, man. Yeah, I, I, I'll go out here and say that one of the conditions for this interview is that when you mention, po you know, there is this like, oh, po podcast, you hear, there's just a lot of them out there. And uh, and after a while, I, I honestly, I get a little tired of hearing myself talk and sure, I need yeah. to take breaks. 
And the reason we're doing this is because you said you wanted to think outside the box and you realize I've been asked a lot of the same questions. We're going to look into some of the things that I've mentioned that I like outside of wrestling, which ultimately always lead back to wrestling in some way, shape, or form. Because had it not been for the Rocky movies, I, I don't think I, you know, would have developed the passion for, uh, you know, not, not, not so much <laughs> competitive sports or com- combat sports, but the emotion involved in them, you know, and uh, the the uh, the storytelling uh, that uh, that can come from them. I think that's maybe what even drew me to you as a fan growing up too, because I'm such a big Rocky fan, and kind of I don't know where or when I would have known that you would, but obviously when you won the WWE <laughs> title for the first time, it was it was definitely clear there. Yeah, 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 and then even at the Hall of Fame, you know, Yo Adrian, I did it, sure. and I think I'd repeated it enough, even though it was only three or four times that they were at landmark times, uh, you know, the first WWE title, and then the, the Hall of Fame that people knew that that was, you know, a movie that I loved, and uh, that was a scene that affected. The one thing about that movie is that Sly says, except for my kid being born, this is the greatest night in the history of my life. I'm like, Wait a second, Adrian was in a coma. <laughs> Like you didn't even see the kid until he was six months old, you know, and that was the one question I had. We, we got to see him together, and I always wondered, like, what if what if Adrian stayed in there for a couple of decades, and the little Rocky Junior's graduating in high school? Is like, Rocky, don't you think you ought to see? He's like, Oh, we got to see him. We got to see him together. Like, Rocky, he's eighteen. You never met him. Like, it's time oh, to put it away. Yeah. yeah. So I that was. One thing, uh, you know, you suspend disbelief, and, but even even when I think I was in, in ninth grade when that came out, uh, when I heard him say the greatest night in the history of my life, the first thing I thought was, Adrian was in a coma. Uh, <laughs> but it was, a, it, was a, it was a great movie. My daughter just caught some footage of me uh, after seeing the original Rocky and not realizing that it was followed up by Rocky II, like on a TV marathon. So she caught me walking the dog and shadow boxing in my red Santa Claus bathrobe <laughs> and then running up the stairs. And like, I didn't know, I, I kind of thought, all right, I'm gonna, if she looks out the window, she'll, she'll get a kick out of this. No idea, A, that she would think to pick up her camera and start filming it, or that B, <laughs> the lighting was just perfect. So it almost looks like I'm like shadow boxing, like in a dream. Yeah, yeah. So Rocky's touched touched my life in a number of ways. Well, do you remember, see, like, I guess seeing it for the first time? How many times did you see it? I mean, movies. If you take us back to 1976, movies yeah. were different than the movie. Just came to you know, there weren't necessarily multiplexes everywhere yet. I mean, it was yeah, it was the old you know the old the block the term blockbuster came from a, a line that wrapped around and actually divided a, a street or a block so it yeah. had to then restart on the other side of the street um and rocky was a was a blockbuster at that time i remember being a being a big boxing i really was a big boxing fan and i loved that that was like kind of like the golden era of george foreman being my favorite and he i think just a year earlier uh or, or that year lost to ali it was it was only a year uh after uh, the rumble in the jungle with mm-hmm. uh frazier and ali um uh, no, no, Zaire was the Rumble in the Jungle. Thrill in Manila was uh, the year before. And so it was kind of a golden age of boxing. And my initial feeling was that I resented a movie with a character trying to portray a boxer. And I went for uh, Chris Lenz's 12th birthday party. Really, you know, very, very cynical. And I walked out a huge fan. So at a certain point, uh, like, like when it was still shut, you know, they're not talking about, uh, um, you know, in pa- the past 20 or 25 years. But I think when you combine the number of times I saw it in the theaters with the number of times I saw it like on home box during its initial release, I believe I'd seen it 36 times. And there were there were days when my, you know, my dad would drop me off at the Port Jefferson uh, twin cinemas and when they would have two. And I would literally, I would go in for like the last 30 minutes of the movie and then sit through it at least one time or another and it was one of those things it was kind of like uh uh 
the Tori Amos song, uh, Winter, and that scene in Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer where the toys on the Misfit uh, Island, uh, Island Misfit Toys, realize they will be rescued. Like, one of only three things to consistently give me goosebumps, like, automatically. And uh, uh, that movie ne never ceased to, to, to touch me in some way. The only difference now is that it doesn't touch me to the point where I go out and exercise. <laughs> Although I did this past, uh, yeah, this past, this past time. But yeah, yeah I mean, t you talk about a movie and, a, and like a line in the sand of sorts between the Rocky fans and the Star Wars fans. And although there was never any like bullying that went on, uh, you know, as a result of, you know, one's affection for Star Wars, I remember s specifically thinking, you can't be both. Like you, you can't be both. You got you have to be one or the other. You're a Rocky guy or a Star Wars guy, and I and I was a Rocky guy. What about the sequels? We talked a little bit about Rocky two there yeah. before with Adrian being in the coma and everything else. What are what are your thoughts on the on the sequels? I guess you know overall. Just just if you want to gloss over them and, and tell me what. Well, uh, you know everything. Yeah, every, I mean, uh, it relate everything back to to you know wrestling in a way. Rocky is is timeless you know you could show rocky a, a hundred years from now just like you could watch a great like steamboat savage is going to play well still plays well today it's going to play well 20 years from now if there's some box that's found hundreds of years from now for you know hopefully they don't yeah, really make it uh, yeah yeah you know. um but that, that match is gonna that movie's gonna hold up well too the, the sequel holds up I believe the sequel holds up really well, whereas the third one is really hurt by the fashion of the times. The like the slightly more than a quarter shirt that Rocky's wearing. The quaffed uh, hair. Yeah, the quaffed hair, uh the high socks, the extended hugging in the <laughs> surf. Uh, maybe they held on to that embrace a little bit too long. Uh and then four, I think to me, is, is really hurt by the sound soundtrack. I'd love to see that movie remade with with a Bill Con either Bill Conti who did the original scores for at least the fir the first two, but it was more a movie of its day and age, sure. and the Cold War theme doesn't you know doesn't hold up nearly as well, and the extent of the violence, just the ridiculous punching they want, it makes it harder to suspend disbelief. Even if you only go back to the, the first movie, if you want to try to point out the mistakes because of the low budget they're on, you can see yeah. that they're empty seats. And the and the final round takes about 30 seconds to, to, to go through. Sure, but yeah. it's still a one... It's, it's, it's flawed in the way that The Wizard of Oz is flawed. That if you sure. want to see the one lollipop guild guy showing up impossibly in several <laughs> different shots yeah. where he couldn't possibly be in... <laughs> Uh, you can you can find fault with it, but it, other I mean, it just it's a perfect movie in the sense that it connects every time through the ages. And then I would, if I had to rate them, I would go with the first one, uh, and then the final one, and then uh, then two, then three, then five, uh, then four. Uh, five five takes a lot of heat, but uh, without five, there is no final Rocky Balboa kind of. Sets the uh, groundwork for that, and it has what is other than just a horribly edited f knockout punch, which misses by a mile, and should have led to the firing, if not execution, of the uh, the, the editor. No, I'm, I'm kidding about yeah, the excuse, sure, by the way. Right, sure. But they, you know, there's no excuse in any day and age. Maybe there's an excuse in the original Frankenstein <laughs> for Boris Karloff to be missing with a punch. No excuse when you've had this amazing street fight choreographed by Terry Funk, one of the great cinematic fights, most realistic fights that I've ever seen. Um, and, then it, uh, and then it ends with a punch that misses by a mile. But uh, I, I thought that movie's a little bit underrated. You know? Absolutely. Well, you know, friend, my best friend Raj is a big fan of Rocky movies as well. We think that Five is, um, is they, they went back to basics with it because yeah. it was kind of like really got cartoony in three and four. It's kind of was right, more like right. it's super. It kind of what happened with Rambo, the same sort of thing, you know, where it was 
just all cartoon and, you know, either suspend your disbelief. I mean, in the fourth one, they're asking us to make the leap that and believe that Polly actually was able to program that robot, robot to be sexy. And there's also some resentment I had even before I was a father saying, yeah, if you're a wife, you, a mother, you don't go to Siberia to watch your husband train and leave your child. <laughs> That's why a he man with a <laughs> history of, yeah. <laughs> and then, then try, put all your uh, financial <laughs> faith in a guy who, you know, whose only shrewd dealing was the uh, the original Shamrock Meats the world, robe. Yeah. Right. By the way, a little Shamrock Meats story. Uh, I had uh, I had written a little uh, uh, blog. I don't. Uh, I call them posts, but it was about how I had gone and done a commercial for uh, Ringside Collectibles, and that my payment. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm arguably pr- pretty big deal in, in the business. You know, you think I? You would think, uh, what's Foley's payment for doing a commercial? Here it is. Toys, I got toys out of it because my kids love the uh, they love the action figures, and I did the uh, commercial just, and they gave me a box of toys. That sounded completely fair. My daughter's now the host of their show, yes, right? Ringside yeah. or Riot. She does an awesome job with that. She's yeah, I, you know, a lot of people connect with her sense of humor, and yeah. uh, while you know, I think you know, a lot of people find my daughter to be very striking, but she's very disarming. You know, she's a lot of fun clearly a nerd you know yeah. and and she's you know I, I think people are really they're really drawn to her and so I made an appearance on you know it, it was me I was <clears throat> I was I was Santa in that uh, you don't have many young kids listening here no, do you? no 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 um, and again I just did it because it, it looked like fun and be a way for me to you know hang out with my daughter or have some fun and uh, they gave me a present and uh, the, the, they pointed out that when I wrote about the deal I made for toys, I said, not since Paulie got two grand and Rocky got the robe has a deal this shrewd been made. Because when Burgess Meredith says, well, you know, what'd you get? And Rocky goes, Paulie got two grand, I got the robe. And Mer- Meredith goes, shrewd. And like, just, just a great line, you know. Most, I didn't even know what that meant at the time. Uh, so when I opened it up, it was a collector's edition of the Shamrock Meats Robe uh, that that Ringside Collectibles had had saved wow. for me, with Stallone's signature on it and a photo of him signing it. And so they gave it to me. I have regifted to to Huey, who was a big Rocky fan, <laughs> sure. and I wasn't sure how that would go. You know, it's either like, oh my god, this is great, or or what is this. And he went the the you know the route of the, the big deal. He made a big deal out of it. And then he goes, Dad, what's this worth? I said, I don't know. Like, look it up. So the going rate is about eighteen hundred dollars for a signed Shamrock Meats robe. Wow. And uh, so I said, you know, he said, Dad, should I sell it? And I said, oh, No. Like that's <laughs> deeply offensive. The very least, wait for Stallone to pass away <laughs> before <laughs> before selling it, so you can make some some real money out of it. Well, I, I did, you know, we, we talked about the fifth movie, we talked about, you know, uh, Terry Funk and all that sort of stuff. Did you ever think about asking Terry to get in touch with Sly? Oh, about the book? No, I mean, or just, just about general? anything, just, you know. I, I hope he got the letter, I really do, because uh, that movie, it meant so much to me. And it was, a, I mean, it was the type of letter that you might just cast aside because it is four handwritten pages. Um, but, uh, I mean, I remember honestly getting a letter from Billy Corgan of Smashing Pumpkins before I really knew much about Smashing Pumpkins. Like I knew who they were and there was a promo I did in, uh, 90, uh, 94 before my rematch uh, with Vader where I was actually in front of a Smashing Pumpkins, uh, poster, but like, I didn't realize what a big deal it was. And it was, it was, a, a handwritten letter about how my career had inspired him at a time when you know when things things were were tough, and I remember like all right, I, I don't know much about this guy or his music, but that's it's really you know, really flattering. And then when I got to know his music and know him and understand what a big deal he was, it became even more so. Um, but I hope I hope Stallone got the letter, you know, and um, uh, and I hope it meant something to him. I'm sure he's heard it a thousand times sure, yeah. about what that movie meant. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you're, you're talking about a guy, you know, who first saw it when he was 12, you know, it's, it's a long time ago. And yeah. for that movie to still 
have that kind of impact. Uh, it's really telling. There's been some knocks on it, thinking all the pre- all, all the president's men should have won the Oscar. It's like, yeah, no, go back and watch all the president's men. It's not going to make you feel what you feel when you when you see Rocky. Well, um, you know, you, you mentioned about seeing it maybe thirty something times or whatever. When when the fifth one happened, it came and went, and I was really young when that came out. That was the last one by all you know yeah, for yeah. sixteen years. Oh. So when the so when the Rocky Balboa came out, I saw it twenty five times in the theater. Really, and I have the ticket stubs to prove it. People it thought Stallone. Thing. When I saw that, you know, Rocky Balboa Spring or whatever it was, you know, I, I was like, oh, well, you got to know when to fold them. And so, what a triumph for for really for Stallone for believing in that character. And it turned his back. career around because he was doing straight to DVD movies yeah, before yeah. that, and it really um, kind of revived. And I wonder. I mean, this is this is tough to speculate um, and painful, I think. But uh, the best promos in life, you know, best promos in wrestling are the ones you know that that deal with real emotions. Sure. Um, and 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 I talked about uh, uh, the the speech I just mentioned on social media the speech that. Uh, Rocky has in the uh, you know in the small you know bedroom with Adrian where he's like I can't beat him I can't beat Creed and he says I just want to go the distance you know that bell rings and I'm still standing for the first time people are gonna know I'm it wasn't just another bum from the neighborhood I'm kind of paraphrasing it there and then somebody um, said yeah with all due respect Mick I think the one he gave about in uh, Rocky Balboa about nothing hits you as hard as life. And I wonder if that wasn't written with his real son in mind, you know, like uh, living in the shadow of a famous dad like that can't be easy. And he lost his son, you know, just, uh, you know, within a year of that. Yeah. And I just, I wondered, like, what was the, because you don't write something that good without some inspiration. And that was just a wonderful, wonderful piece of uh, cinema there. Well, you know, uh, what's, what's interesting about that, too, is that, uh, you know, you know, he had to figure out where to start because it was you know, to make it different. He yeah. had to, Adrian had to be no longer with us. And I went um, with my dad on a tour filled up. We got all the locations and everything. Actually, Adrian Balboa's grave is actually in the cemetery that it was in. It's in the front. Really? You can see the grave. I can it show still you says picture. Adrian Balboa. It says Adrian Balboa, and the chair is next to it. The chair really? is sitting there. It's in a. Spe- it's not where it was in the movie, but it's in a special place in the yeah, front. Yeah, yeah. Um, we went there. We also went to the... the Adrian's restaurant is a real restaurant. What's the name of the restaurant? The Victor Cafe. Uh, you'll have to tell me. I'll when tell we're you about where it's located. I'm actually in a unique position. Um, by the time this, most people hear this, probably uh, the rumble will be over, right? Yep. yep. So it's uh, it's okay for me to say I, I'm going. It's yeah. weird. I'm yeah. going to Philadelphia, but I'm not going to the rumble. Rumble to me has become the second biggest event of the year. It really, it really has. I mean, we can say SummerSlam is second biggest. I think people look forward to the rumble. Uh, um, right behind Mania, and so um, you know, my my uh, my kids are going, and I believe I'm driving my youngest, who will meet the two older ones. They don't want to hang out with him on Saturday, <laughs> so I'll actually be in Philadelphia, and uh, and I homeschool my two younger kids, and that sounds like an educational field trip to me. You know, we went, they... we saw the apartment, everything is in the. You know, it's funny. The mix is uh, like the, the the block is still the same. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the mighty mix, the, the sign was the facade, obviously, but I actually took a picture of my dad in front of it, and then I, I photoshopped the sign in there. Hey, so cool. Well, dead. listen, after we're done, you'll have to give me some of that info. Absolutely, yeah. You know, I mean, I guess we could go see the Liberty Bell and <laughs> Constitution <laughs> Hall, but... We didn't bother uh, yeah, with any of uh, that stuff, yeah. 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 Um, real, real quick, to finish up on some Rocky stuff real quick, oh, did you, are you aware of the, the new... Because, again, I was saying with the sixth movie... I saw it so many times. Cause this, I'm never going to see him on the screen again. This character, but right now they're it's it's they're filming it right now. It's Creed, and what it is, it's not a prequel or anything like that. It's Apollo Creed's grandson oh. is getting into boxing, and he enlists the help of Rocky Balboa. Really, Stallone is actually reprising his role once again as a supporting. It's a supporter yeah. role now. Uh, so this is the first time he's. Not he's consulted on everything. Was the first time he's not written the dialogue for the character. Very so it should cool. be really interesting. You know, I had wanted to write a prequel uh, uh, for uh, <laughs> the wrestler and call it the Ram, you know Ram, 
because uh, the wrestler was. I mean, it was such a great movie about a guy who made really poor choices. Yeah, and I, I, I knew that guy, and that was my era. You know, he would have been a few years before me, but uh, I knew those guys when I was breaking in. The guys who had starred in the. Uh, in the territories, you know, in the in the seventies and eighties, uh, who had gotten the big break and who were now back doing, you know, doing shows uh, with me, and uh, I was like, man, I, I really thought I could have torn into that. First of all, I'd have to see if I could get the rights to it. Sure, yeah. I could always call it something other than Ram, and because it would be just my idea, my ideas of how that life could have ended up that way. Um, but I thought that would be a pretty pretty cool. Uh, if I ever went back to writing, that's one of like three or four projects I'd like to take on. Okay, I just want to take a quick break from our interview to tell everybody about one of our great sponsors, WrestlingDVDNews.com. Visit WrestlingDVDNews.com for exclusive insider news and reviews on all the latest WWE DVDs and Blu-rays first. What's the next WWE DVD release on the horizon? Which should you buy and which should you avoid? How is the WWE Network changing the company's strategy on DVDs? Plus, get involved with their multiple giveaways each and every month for your chance to win WWE DVDs absolutely free. It's all happening now at WrestlingDVDNews.com. Now, back to our interview. I wanted to ask you about the writing, too, because it seems like, and this is just my take on it, and you can let me know what you think here. One of the first wrestling, I mean, there were a couple out before, but you write a wrestling book. It's a bestseller. Right. Everybody else starts writing a wrestling Not just book. a bestseller. Sorry, excuse me, number one. Okay, thank you. Number one uh, bestseller. Um, then you start doing, you know, comedy and all this stuff, and now you hear about all these other guys doing comedy. Uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? Just not to put you on the spot, but just, I mean, is that something where you feel kind of uh, honored or that there are people who are kind of following in your footsteps? Because it seems well, like well, there's a lot of guys doing comedy. Yeah, well, the now. books... Um, the the books are different because uh, you know there it was the completely uh, um, understandable and accepted uh, point of just having someone else do the work the work for you. Yeah. So I think what's odd in wrestling and we get you know we get picked on and still made fun of a little bit in public for doing what we do. Uh, but we're the only sport where people are now regularly writing their own books. Like, I haven't seen a surge, and I could be wrong. If there are baseball players out there who are doing their own work, or basketball players, football players, UFC fighters, I apologize. I just don't know of any. Whereas mm-hmm. in wrestling, there have been like eight or, you know, eight, ten, maybe more guys actually doing their own writing. And I think that's the, the you know, the biggest accomplishment of my book was saying, yeah, it can be done. And then when I took these stories on the road, um, I think it showed other people that wait a second, I've got I've got stories too, and everyone does. Um, I just, I really respect the guys who go out and put the work in. You know, that's that's the that's the difference. Is that there's a lot of guys who want to say, I'd like to do a Q and A and get paid. And then when you say, would you be willing to go out there on your off nights in front of twelve people for free, and tank? and feel as bad as you've ever felt emotionally in your life, like in order to get to a point where you can tell those stories, well, most guys are going to say no. Um, but the Q&A format is perfect for a natural storyteller like a, like a Cornette. Uh, uh, William Regal is a great storyteller. I imagine that Ric Flair will, will probably do really well. Um, when he does his thing in the UK, so you know, you you're, you're in a way, it's asking people to just tell their stories, which is interesting. I, I would have been better off just saying Mick Foley, you know, an audience with Mick Foley, than I would have trying to label what I did as comedy. But at the in the beginning, I want to kind of back away from wrestling and do something completely different. And then I realized, wow, well, this is kind of these stories are kind of what make you know my show unique. And I have got you. Know, you've you've seen you've seen it a few times. And uh, if it looks effortless, it's because a lot of work has been put into it. That's you know? the thing is that people don't realize that there's a way you you do. There's a lot of kind of it's called wordsmithing that you do. Yeah, where you're just yeah. Finding the right word and the there, way yeah. to inflect it. Yeah, inflect it. You know, it might be one word, and then you finish a show, and you say, I I could have gotten that better. I could have made this word bigger. How do I, you know, how do I conclude? How do I bring back uh, something that I that I mentioned in the beginning for a laugh? And and as 
uh, you and I were talking about over lunch. Um, I had a story on the last tour, which was, <laughs> it starts with me asking Mr. McMahon if I can leave Madison Square Garden uh, for my Hall of Fame induction on a sleigh with Santa Claus. And then I get really intense. And what makes the story work, this is you were saying, explain why it works, is the more intense I get, the more people forget that it started out about a story, as a story about <laughs> asking Mr. McMahon if I can fly into the sky on a sleigh with Santa, so that when I bring it around, it's like either subconsciously or kind of, this is a story about Santa Claus, you know, and you catch people who ordinarily, if you would ask them, would you get on your feet and cheer a grown man telling a story about Santa? No, that would be ridiculous. And then you get people caught up in the, in the emotion and they forget it's a story about Santa. And so then when you come back to it, it's like it's like a release. It's like, you know, a pop in, in wrestling or a release in other Walks of life. It feels, it feels, it feels good. Uh, and, and then that that story started out because uh, somebody asked me uh, a qu a question in Scotland about uh, the first ever buried alive match, um, and I mentioned that you know along the way, in some way, like they were able to make you know a bolt of lightning come down from the scoreboard in, in Indianapolis. In truth. It didn't, you know, if you look at it, it didn't come down from the scoreboard. But that's my recollection of it, and that's what everyone else thought at yeah. the time. Uh, and then I think I mentioned that, uh, you know, hey, uh, they got a, a, a bolt of lightning to come down from the scoreboard. They couldn't get some, you know, some dry ice for my entrance <laughs> one time. So I think I'm the one guy who never had any kind of special effects on his entrance. And when I got back... Uh, from the show, uh, Billy Kirkwood, a great uh, Scottish comedian, was like, you got to make that part of the show, mate. And that's a horrible Scottish accent. <laughs> so I'll just say, you got to make that part of the show. I was like, really? It's a like, great story, great story. And so I started working it in. And it's like a match in that sense, you know, like you, so you, you have a set number of moves, you know, especially a guy with the limited physical capabilities that I had. And then you just try to find the most interesting ways of make incorporating those moves. Uh, along the way. So back to your question, um, I'm like a, like a guy like Dolph Ziggler who does spend his off nights, you know, doing open mics is a guy like I told him, I wrote him, Dolph, you know, anytime you want to do anything on my shows, you know, uh, just, just let me know. So he may be doing something on the 8th in, in Phoenix. I have a lot of respect for anyone who's, I, I understand the guys who just want to do Q&As, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not like I don't respect it. But I have an admiration for guys willing to work hard to do anything. And I'll go out of my way to help those guys. Well, it's one of those things, too, where it's like you are, when you're up there on stage, and I've never done stand-up, but you're people are there and they're saying, make me laugh, basically. Yeah. Tell me, you know, so there's that thing where it's not, it's it's a, it's a step beyond public speaking. It's a step beyond some of the things that's where, you know, you have to make it look seamless even though there's so much preparation that goes into it. And, you know, that's, that's I guess, what the art of it is, is that, we're you know, um, uh, the audience is not supposed to be able to tell us the same. Well, it's, yeah, it should look like you're, you're coming up with stuff naturally. And some of the stuff does, you know, and then you have to remember what it was about that line that they liked. Okay, I can work on that. And then sometimes, you know, like now that I'm, you know, kind of getting the uh, – hang of technology i'll use the notes thing on my phone and i'll and i'll have a you know uh I'll make a little question a notation like even if it's something as simple as like you know the most uh the most credible wrestling promos would come from aaron hernandez <laughs> he wouldn't have to do a lot to convince you that he would kill you if given the chance like aaron, i think he will kill me you know like and that's uh, you chuckle. You got to then you have to find a way to make it funny, and that involves uh, you know starting from scratch, which I'll be doing after this tour winds up in March, and then when I go back out on the road in May, you know I might even like have free eight by tens for everyone because they'll be going to see a show that's not you know not quite finished. They'll be going to see a bunch of ideas, and then the like the I think the you know the magic on those shows is seeing what works. And then finding things that become part of the part of the show along the way. So it's a, it's a it's a really cool process. It reminds me of wrestling, and when things are going really well, 
it's it's I swear it's like being in the ring without you know the 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 obvious you know physical problems that come with entertaining people. Yeah, well, you've been, I mean, that's the thing you say, that there may be a thing where there's a stigma with wrestlers or any of that stuff with the general public, but the fact of the matter is you're in front of thousands of people and you, you know, you know, on a microphone already, so it sort of lends itself to... It, do, it does, but cutting a promo doesn't mean different. you'll be able to, you know, to, sure. to, to take people on that ride for an hour and, you know, an hour and 20 minutes. Uh, and then in, in my case, I decided about a little over a year ago that I was going to try to do just one F-bomb. So it's like taking away a, a big crutch that a lot of guys use. And uh, and there are times when, when a line really is funnier with that F-bomb. But the 30th or 40th time you've used it, it's kind of lost its effectiveness, which is why I compare it to the steel chair. You know, you use a steel sure. chair to the head once in the right place. Oh, my God, look at the drama and the realism you use it 30 times kind of loses its uh kind of loses its emphasis so uh yeah i mean one of my uh, i think one of my favorite shows even though it wasn't one of my best shows was when i was getting ready to do the gathering of the juggalos uh, this past summer and i could hear the band on the main stage just dropping f-bomb after f-bomb and i was like I, should I try to compete with that? Like, is this a crowd I'm going to have to, like, you know, shock and awe into submission? I'm like, no. I'm going to give them a G-rated show for 40 minutes. I'm going to give them G-rated comedy, and I'm going to make them like it. And they did. It wasn't the best set that I ever did. I did lose my temper at the end when, uh, uh, you know, some person that I thought was a male kept shouting on a megaphone. And then I and I finally, you know, and I, my mind kept saying five more minutes, five more minutes. Nobody's been hurt. You, there have been no bodily <laughs> fluids thrown your way. Which is good at that uh, yeah, kind of event. Count your too, blessings. Yeah. And I finally just said, if you don't stop using that megaphone, I'm going to walk out there, borrow a phrase from the rock, turn that blank, 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 <laughs> blank, sideways, and shove it up your blank. And then I said, sir, will you at least have the decency to stand up so I could see you? And I heard these murmurings. And I went, that's not a dude? <laughs> and then the non-dude proceeded to flash me the worst set of boobs. Uh-huh. I'm happy with almost any set of boobs. I, I believe, you know, like the Dolly Parton song says, everything's beautiful in its own way. Not these boobs. Uh, and I went, oops, sorry about that, sir. <laughs> I mean, ma'am, and I got a laugh, and then over the megaphone came this voice who went, "That's okay, Mick. I forgive you." And it got the big, you know, the big laugh. So That's this great. thing that had disaster written all over it turned out to be a, a fun show. Well, I, I do want to switch gears and talk a little bit uh, about wrestling here. And oh, oh, uh, well, well, I want to, <laughs> I, I want to ask you about something that hasn't really been covered much. It's it, uh, Hell in the Cell thing I've heard about. No, oh! I'm, joking. I'm just joking. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> By the way, I, I, you've been to my show. Like, I pretend I don't want to talk about it. Sure. And then they like drag me in. Uh, but the truth is, since the Hall of Fame induction and since the Terry Funk speech, uh, it's it's shed a new light on that match for me. And now a part of the challenge is to take something which would not appear to be funny on its surface and then find the humor in it. That's what's so brilliant about the way you put it in your show and everything. I guess it seems like to me it's maybe like your piano man or your hit that you have to keep, you know. <laughs> well, I have to find different variations for it. Sure, So yeah. um, I don't, there were nights where I don't touch on it at all and there are other nights where it, where it will come up in the Q&A and I'm like, okay, I can't tell the same story I told last time. But it's amazing to see like how many things were going on behind the scenes, incorporate those into what I was experiencing, the conversation between Funk and Undertaker that I wasn't privy to because I was unconscious. You know, and, and again, you take these situations which don't seem to lend themselves to humor and you find the humor in it. And that's the, the, that's the challenge for the ne- my next year's show which will be beginning in May, is I've got some really sobering subjects that I intend to make funny. And I may be finding my way those first few months, and that's why I'll give the first week, weeks of people like the free <laughs> 8 by 10 <laughs> like You're, nice, you're more yeah. or less going to see like a, a public rehearsal. Um, and then if, if I can't find the humor, like if it's a da- just a downer, then I'll, I'll shift gears and I'll, and I'll find some other stories. But that's my hope is that I can cover some serious, you know, wrestling related yeah. material 
in a in a funny way. Well, the wrestling I want to talk to you is the stuff that you're a fan of because you know again. Uh, with all due respect, it has been covered a lot yeah, in your career, yeah. and there's a lot of great interviews you've done, and even shoot interviews and all those sorts of things. So, it, plus the books, of course, we got yeah, man. Those. But uh, I want to talk to you about just wrestling real quick because you grew up in in Long Island, right? Uh, so you were obviously a WWWF fan, right? Right. Uh, so, grow. Do you remember the first time you sort of? discovered it or what or i guess maybe what's the first thing you latched on to man i think it was eight or nine you know and uh and bruno wasn't on tv a lot wrestling the champion didn't wrestle much on tv at the time which is why i am not opposed to brock lesnar not being a regular on tv you know i mean there's a a balance there and i think they went a little too far uh with the lack of appearances although he would have his uh um his 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 ambassador Paul Paul his advocate Paul Heyman making appearances on his behalf, but um, like I, I remember just the, the spectacle, you know, like the spectacle. When I was eight or nine, it was different than when I was a teenager, and I had a yeah. very clear idea of what I wanted to see. But I liked the brawls, you know. I mean, I liked the I liked the, the spe- you know the spectacle, uh, you know. I liked the larger than life characters. I was a big fan. Um, I mean, I loved the way Mr. McMahon called matches in an over-the-top style. So the guys in, in Georgia and other parts of the country, you know, would hear a guy like Gordon Soley calling it a sport. Or in, you know, Mid-South, they'd hear Jim Jim Ross with his inimitable style. But I, I was a fan of the, oh, 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 down to the canvas. Oh, oh, my goodness. And so that when I call matches in my head, like, I'm, I'm still Vince McMahon, you know, oh, my goodness. And what a maneuver just covers <laughs> everything. What a what a maneuver. Did you find that in the early days of Vince's commentary, he almost had a little bit of a you know Howard Cosell thing going? A little bit. He was probably influenced by yeah. Howard Cosell. And I love the, but I, you know, I remember seeing that Vince, you know, for you know for everything that he, you know. Um, the ego he's accused of having, and sure. like nobody makes it to that place in business without one. But uh, when it came to time to put over the guys, you know, he would. Uh, I don't know whether he'd have the talent standing on the phone book or whether there was a hole like for him to stand in. But he would look up at Andre the Giant, like Andre was eighteen inches taller than him, you know, instead of eleven or twelve, sure, yeah. eight or nine. You know, Vince is a tall guy, and then Vince would stand, you know, with his legs apart to appear shorter than he actually did. And I love that. In, I love that interview style too. I love those quick interviews that would come in, and I love the way the show was done. Right, right by the ring. Uh, there yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, the truth is, if you went back to those days and watched those shows with, uh, you know, a, a nothing, you know, a non-competitive match taking place, and then an announcer coming in uh, this Friday and Poughkeepsie, you know, that stuff would look awful by today's standards. You know, uh, and I know this is I know this is originally said about pizza and sex, but I'm gonna throw wrestling in and make it a trifecta. Like when it's good, it's really good. And even when it's bad, it's it's not that bad. So, you know, sure, for all the yeah. complaints people have about on Raw, some of them deserved. Like, you know, even even a disappointing Raw like has some good moments in it. Oh, you know, absolutely. you're like, ah, it was good enough. I'll 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 be there again next Monday. And of course there's some people, you know, if you have a bad experience with pizza Often enough, you may stop eating pizza, and so some people may stop watching Raw. But I'd say it takes several bad experiences before someone believes that the negatives overcome the positives of watching on a Monday night. There's the the famous story about you hitchhiking to see, you know, the the Snuka and Morocco match. Yeah. What would, what was your first event that you went to live? Yeah, it wasn't until 83, you know, that was uh, the age where, you know, I was allowed to start taking trains. And I was always scared. I Honestly, my brother loved the city. Uh, New York City was, you know, has been cleaned up a lot. The yeah, idea of going yeah. to Times Square, and I just remember vividly going in and, like, seeing a marquee with a movie title, Spank Me. <laughs> And I, and I thought of New York as kind of a scary, you know, a scary place, not a place that I wanted to go under any circumstances. You know, uh, Yankee Stadium was just kind of a place you drove into and drove out of as, as quickly as you could. And the Bronx was an incredibly tough place. And I'm not just, this is, you know, this is coming from a guy who did a lot of thorough research for the Bronx for my uh, 2005 book, Scooter. But it was uh, it was so bad that, uh, you know, it was where, pre- you know, 
candidates would come to do their speeches amid the pile of rubble. They actually had the survivors from Hiroshima, not pronounced Hiroshima because I've been to Japan and know, would know yeah. actually coming like to you know in in into the Bronx to make their statements about the state. You know the state of the world, so it was kind of a, a you know it was it was it was a it was a tough place, and um, I didn't I didn't uh, start going in on my own until I was seventeen years old, and so the first match I would have seen live would have been Snooker Morocco in June of eighty three, so and uh, yeah, at that. first it was you know all my friends would go. I believe their thing they had um, uh, uh, June of eighty three. Uh, they had a rematch in July. Um, and then the, the, the cage match in October. I don't know what took place in the couple months following that. Uh, but, but by the time, you know, by the time we'd gone to two or three as a, as a group, you know, and then it was like, oh, hey, garden, great. Now it's the Coliseum. And I, you know, by that point, my friends had driver's licenses. We'd go to the Coliseum. And then they kind of, like, let me know, like, we're not as into this as you oh, are. Yeah. And that's when I started going, you know, places by myself, which kind of set my... Uh, you know my, you know my, my standards for socializing <laughs> for years to come. Like if people didn't want to go, I just I just go by myself. What was it like though in the garden? I guess that that the atmosphere then, because again, going to a show, then you, you just look at it. You can watch them on the network. Now. Yeah, yeah. It looks well, they, at that time they had uh, wrestling from Madison Square Garden, and that was such a treat for me uh, because the matches, like I said. Um, on WOR TV, the, the old WWWF, and then the WWF, where they used, uh, oh, I'm trying to think, um, the uh, they used a Moody Blues song was one of them. Gemini Dream oh, was okay, one of the yeah. intros. Um, but they had two different two different shows on, uh, consisting of non-competitive matches, and then they'd have wrestling from the garden on MSG once you got cable you could watch wrestling from the garden and these were the good matches because so the, garden, the equivalent of almost a pay-per-view yeah the, the garden yeah. was to people of that time their pay-per-views you know and of course you know they would say you know you'd have shorter matches and some that weren't so good but they would build up to that big match that took place either before intermission or or at the end of the show yeah. so they were great just in the pre uh the the, the pre Hogan era you know, I was there when Backlund dropped the strap to the Iron Sheik. Uh, and I was there the month after Hogan won the belt uh, back from the Sheik. I believe I saw him defending against Paul Orndorff. Uh, when you're there at the show, are you getting, in terms of merchandising, it's in its infancy, but did you get program? I mean, were you, I would get were the you program. buying these things? Yeah, there... they didn't have a snooker. I mean, uh, they, they, you know, they made it hard. It made it harder. Like I, I never had a snooker shirt because, I, to the, my knowledge, they didn't sell one at the uh, arenas. I had the snooker poster, which I still mean to get to Tamina. You know, the exact one I had hanging over my bedroom mm. in both high school and college. Um, and I believe I got those at the shows. But uh, you know, merchandising was in its infancy, so there was obviously no WWE shop. You know, dot yeah. com. Right. Uh, you got what you could get. If you had a wrestling T-shirt, it's because you really before you know once once Hogan came in, it became easier, and the merchandising just seemed like a no-brainer. But to get a Snooker shirt or something of that order was really difficult at the time. We talked about a little bit about uh, you know we got about ten minutes left. Sure, okay. got, got it. Okay, talked a little bit before about you know how different movies were and everything back in the day. But this time, you know, VCR just started coming out. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah. how did that sort of change or? Kind of enhance your fandom of wrestling. Were you, did you, were were you trading tapes back at that time, or were you just sort of taping what was on? Or I was ta- I was taping what was on, and in a weird way, uh, those Madison Square Garden to show you uh, the the infancy <laughs> that that tape trading was in. Um, it wasn't until I showed up in uh, spring of 1985 for an independent show at my old high school, uh, where my father was the athletic director. Um, that uh, I, I mentioned to somebody that I had a bunch of you know matches from the garden, and it was what it was. I think it was Sergeant Slaughter's uh, manager at the time uh, who said, "Like we don't get to see these tapes. Like, can you bring them?" So I remember like taking a trip home, and I also brought back the loved one. You know, yeah. you know yes, that, that, okay, conveniently, yeah, right. yeah. you know that was seen by by a few of the wrestlers, and that was like my way into the. Uh, wrestling business when promoter tommy d saw these 
uh, the moral of the story is it pays to be nice to people younger than you. You know, when I was a senior, I, I mean, I, I, I wasn't, I, I, it, to say I was not popular or didn't fit in would be a little bit of a, an exaggeration. People did like me. I had trouble getting women to like me, but the guys thought I was cool, you know, and the younger guys always thought I was a, a good guy, and I had a, you know, reputation, for, you know, being a little, uh, you know, out there, which was cool, you know. Um, and when they, they had heard about this home movie we put together, that's what they wanted to see. They were now the seniors. And so they're, you know, I'm, they're seeing a guy who was always cool to them, you know, which is a big, big life's lesson, I think. Because without those seniors going crazy watching the tape of the loved one, I don't think Tommy D then sees the the you know sees this collection of people. I don't think he gets stars in his eyes. I don't think he invites me to be part of his ring crew. I don't think I get the entryway to meeting Dominic Tanucci and training in Pittsburgh. So it's possible none of that would have happened without first going home to get videotapes that the guys can watch. And so for these guys to be able to sit there and watch garden matches on TV, you know, it was was really a treat for them. So that was like my end. I was Sarge's manager, like, saying, can you run off a few of these? <laughs> for, you know, now it's a touch of the button, you know. Right, you can see any yes. match you want to see. But that time, like, to have Slaughter's matches with Backland and have the boot camp match he did with Sheik, and to have now a way of watching these was really cool. So it was uh, that connection I made to where it was actually Sergeant Slaughter leaving tickets for me at the Meadowlands, you know, in uh, later on in 85. Uh, but that was the night when I became part of Tommy D's ring crew. And so when I went back to uh, uh, college uh for the fall of uh fall of 85 started setting up rings uh in the new york metropolitan area including long island well it's only about a year before you'd be in the the wwf in in some way after that that was 85 i I actually yeah i actually showed up in wwf yeah only yeah i mean uh it was uh a fall uh late summer of 86 i mean i had a little over a year's experience and I had my first match in Clarksburg, West Virginia, in front of two or 300 people at the Armory. And uh, next thing I know, I'm in front of 16,000 people or 17,000 people in Providence, Rhode Island, you know, wrestling the Bulldogs. So it was a, it was a baptism uh, by fire. What, what, at what point did you start to, because I'm sure there's a point where it becomes you're, you're a fan and then all of a sudden it switches over where this is now your work and what you do. Yeah. Do you remember... Did that consciously sort of happen, or was it over time? Well, I always remained a, I always remained a fan, you know, always loved it. And I'd say the key, go back to the tape trading, the key point in my tape trading days was, was meeting Brian, uh, Brian Hildebrandt, who okay, uh, later, yeah. uh, he refereed as Mark Curtis in WCW. He was a really great student of the game and a great, a great friend who passed away from stomach cancer a, a while, you know, at yeah. least 10 years now. Um, but he turned me on to the world of... Japanese wrestling, and that's where I saw, you know, Brody, that's where I saw uh, Dynamite Kid, that's where I saw Terry Funk, uh, and and uh, those are probably the three biggest influences outside of just being on hand at Madison Square Garden and, you know, feeling the way I did when Snuka uh, dove off the top of the steel cage, like getting that rush and having that definite feeling of, wanting to make people the way that I felt at that time, uh, seeing uh, Brody with that brawling style and seeing Dynamite Kid using his body as a weapon uh, made me think that I could somehow combine those two styles to create like a, a hybrid. And then just, you know, like like so many people after me and before me, just blatantly ripped off Terry Funk's mannerisms and <laughs> <laughs> the spirit of Terry Funk. So so to this day when people are like, you know, how do you feel about Wade Barrett dropping the elbow? I'm like, I love it. You know, how do you feel about Dean Ambrose doing the DDT? Yeah. I love it. And they go, really? Like, well, first of all, it's the, you know, it's like the, the sincerest form of, uh, flattery, you know. I mean, I mean, the fact these guys are incorporating things that I did that were well, you know, well, well-known moves. 
Uh, I, I love seeing that on TV. And I said, secondly, at the end of the day, we're all just borrowing from Terry Funk. You know, <laughs> like, so I can't really say, how dare you steal a move that I stole from Kenta Kobashi? You know, how dare you take the elbow that, that uh, you know, Buddy Rogers dropped, uh, Roberts dropped before me. But, uh, yeah, I, 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 was, I was influenced in a major way by what I saw especially from Japan. I liked, I mean, I liked watching Lucha Libra, but I realized that wasn't going to be something that, you know, that fit my style. But before we wrap up here, I want to ask you, what is something that's, something that we can't find in the WWE Network that you maybe remember from back in the day, maybe something with Brody or something that, that you might encourage people to try to find maybe on YouTube or, or somewhere else that you, well, you know, the, a great angle or a great match? Although there, were, there was never a conclusive finish, uh, I, that's the way business was done at that time. The stuff with Brody and Antonio Inoki was was so good because Brody had to look strong because he was Brody. Inoki had to look strong because he ran the company. And if you accept that you're not going to have a conclusive finish to any of those matches, they're ju- they're just they look like wars. Uh, and then the the uh, Dynamite Kid Tiger Mask series. You really can't go wrong with any of those matches. Uh, I'm sure there were some that stood out about others, but that would be the homework assignment for today. Brody had great matches with so many people, but uh, uh, some of the stuff he did, you know, with uh, Inoki uh, in New Japan was tremendous, and the stuff that uh, Tiger Mask and Dynamite Kid did uh, was is highly, highly recommended. Foley watching. Awesome. And last question here. You know, you mentioned I'm a filmmaker, and we did the documentary together. I just want to know a little bit about the production value, uh, like when it, what, it, what went into the loved one. What kind of camera <laughs> did you use? Where did you get it? Just, just. Uh, well, at that time, uh, you know, this is this predates you. At that time, I mean, it was definitely a commitment. I, I we mentioned, and then the uh, <laughs> on the ride over here that there was more of a commitment involved in tape trading, you know, like yeah. you had, you know, physically send stuff out. You would wait in the mail and <laughs> things were coming from sure. around the, the country or the world. And now it's at the touch of a button. It's similar to, you know, adult, <laughs> adult video. <laughs> in the old days, if you want to watch an adult video, there was a sacrifice that went into that. You would go to the tape store Desperately hope you didn't see anyone in the that, back you know, or wherever, go yeah. through that curtain, and and you would actually in some one store, Port Jefferson, actually have to write down your name like it was a library card, and you'd go to like the K. Parker movies, and there'd be Michael F. Foley signing it out like <laughs> eight different times. Is that I only? Oh, you went, could see the names. Oh, you could see the that. names. Like like I'm saying, it was it was. It was like the walk of shame, you know. <laughs> and then you go up there with your head down, looking at your shoes, and right. your parents had to be out of the house, you know, for that day. And then you would make that purchase, and you know, and sometimes at a communal event, you'd have friends come over because it was such a cool thing to be <laughs> to be watching something like that. But in the same way, it was easier to watch, and I think you appreciated it more because you had that tape, and you couldn't, you know, you had that tape, and it didn't matter that it was a sixth generation that it was fuzzy you'd be parked in front of that thing and in my case like studying moves that i thought that maybe i could borrow from and and i talk about in my current show how like i really love the moves that i i love movies i i could figure out but i was fascinated with the moves i could not figure out and some of the stuff that uh you know that uh, dynamite kid did for example i could not figure out and i thought like wow what if i came up with a style that consisted entirely of moves that people can't figure out. That's a good idea when you're 19, you know. And then obviously, as, you know, as you get into your 20s and 30s, it's no longer such a good idea to be basing your style around those moves that absolutely positively do jar and shock your body. Um, but yeah, I loved uh, I, 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 I love those trape dating days. You had one last question that I haven't actually answer, answered, and what was it? It was about the production about your camera. Oh yeah, and all yeah. That stuff. Just, so, to, just to give everybody an idea, because they can make something on their yeah, phone now. Again, rented yeah. camera, big camera, and at that time you'd have to have uh, 
like it was almost like Batman's utility belt <laughs> with batteries wrapped around the waist <sighs> of the cameraman. So he'd have the camera on one shoulder with the rest of the the, the video cassette recorder. You know, was with it the VHS tape. or was it beta? VHS. Was, it was VHS. VHS. Okay. So it was a heavy camera with uh, with you have to be carrying around the actual tape recorder. And you'd have uh, a belt of six to eight batteries going around your waist because each one only lasted a few minutes, and that's how we uh, we shot uh, um, how we shot the loved one. And if you go back, I mean, given the primitive production values, I mean our uh, <laughs> our montage video where I'm appearing, you know, before the days of photoshopping, I'm actually cutting out photos of myself that were about the same size as Don Morocco or. Uh, you know, road warrior animal, and and I appear to be, you know, like in some ways better than others. You know, I mean, the time man of the year thing is pretty good. You know, it's it's ba- it's ba- <laughs> Begin, Sadat, and Carter, and I I think I just kind of like you know put myself over President Carter, but it was the same like, red, and I was wearing these cheap one dollar sunglasses, you know, red sunglasses. And the key was that they were like outlined in red. The characters were, you know, the yeah. two the two world leaders. And so I just outlined myself in red, and I appear to be on that same issue of Time Magazine. So real primitive, you know. But the editing was done in a pretty good way. We had our big pull apart fight scene with Ishmala, the Puerto Rican giant, the real life Ishmael Lozada, who you know, with enough alcohol consumption, we convinced to go out in five degree weather in his underwear, you know, and do our wrestling. <laughs> sequences so it was like a great it was a great time of bonding you know to be there at the foley house where my parents had gone to you know see my brother in college and we made a we made a home movie well that's part of the charm of it and that's why you know it's it's something that's special for that time you definitely went the extra mile there so there's a lesson for all the kids out there you know i think there's a yeah there's a big lesson there um, well, Mick, thank you so much again. Thanks for really the novel, your too, t- Paradise Alley. Absolutely enjoy it. Um, you know, hopefully your kids enjoy the movie, too, when you guys We'll check watch it, it and Netflix as a special too. treat, as we fade out, it'll be on me singing, So far from paradise, I'm so far away. Someday you'll treat me nice, brother. I've metamorphosized into snooker along the way. <laughs> what a way to end the interview. That was Mick singing the song Too Close to Paradise that Sylvester Stallone actually sang. The Sylvester Stallone sang a song at the end of his own movie. He didn't have his brother Frank do it this time. He said, hey, Frank, step aside. I'm going to take this one. And he sang it himself. So this is why you really need to see this movie and uh, check this song out. But uh, he, he, Mick did it with a little bit of a Jimmy Snooker twist, uh, which uh, <laughs> we could really uh, appreciate, which was hilarious. And, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, not enough I could say about Mick Foley. Just such an awesome guy. You know, he's got that... Uh, you know, that, that thing about him being the nicest guy in wrestling, and, and it's true. I mean, uh, you know, any time that we've seen him, gotten to spend time together, I mean, he's done meet and greets and everything after his comedy shows that last sometimes three or four hours. So it goes well into the night, and he stays, makes sure everybody gets to take a picture, make sure everybody gets an autograph or whatever it is. So, you know, he's such a great guy, and I really encourage you to check out his comedy shows. Uh, if you are, if you're, you know, even wondering at all what that's about, go to realmickfoley.com. Um, we mentioned it, Mick mentioned it earlier, but we made a documentary together recently that kind of highlights what his comedy is all about. And um, if you've seen his show before, and you kind of know, well, you think, well, you know, maybe I've seen him before, and that's that's it. He's got all new stuff now, so. You know, the, this, the, and he's got an infinite amount of material because of so many stories and just everything. And I mean, he could do a one man show about, you know, Vince McMahon alone, I think, uh, which would be amazing. But, uh, you know, really encourage you to check out his shows. The, the, you could find the, you know, the list of where he's touring. He tours all over the place. So go to realmickfoley.com. 
Look up the dates. Make sure you get out to a comedy club and see him. Again, for the price that you get in there, for the cost, the price of admission, not only do you get to see the show, but you get to meet the man afterwards. And um, it's it's really cool, you know, being, uh, you know, we were able to travel with him for a couple of days. Um, you know, again, he's gracious with every single fan that he comes into, gives them the time. And not only that, it's really cool just to see how, you know, loved the guy is. Uh, he is the loved one after all. I mean, because... You know, you know myself growing up. Uh, like I said, I mean, I had a birthday party that was all mankind themed. I mean, it's this is you know, and so it's really cool to you know to be able to say that we we've worked together and uh, I gotten to know him a little bit. So it's it's a it's a real honor and privilege that uh, you know he's able to come on and and do this podcast with me. So we really appreciate it. And uh, but that's all the time we have for this week. I think it might be appropriate before we go to leave you with a little sample of what Mick was singing before the original. Mick was great, but we've got to hear a little bit of the original here from Sly himself. Hope you enjoy it. Thanks so much for joining me, and I'll see you next time. Thank you for listening. For more, visit the Network Nation at 999nation.com.